Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Doorstep Podcast. I'm your co-host, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Council, Nick Vosdev. And I'm Tatiana Serafin, also Senior Fellow here at Carnegie Council. Welcoming today back to the Doorstep, Rachel Ziemba, who is an Adjunct Senior Fellow at the Center for a New American Security. Last year, she spoke to us about sanctions. But this year she's back talking about sanctions and we'll hear from her in a minute because that's on everybody's minds. Um, What are they? Will they work? Will Putin respond? What is going on uh, with Putin, NATO, US, Ukraine? Um, Rachel had some great comments. Uh, We'll hear from her in a minute. Uh, So glad she was able to come back. Um, But um, before our talk today, Nick, I I, I wanna bring it to you a part of the world that, again, you know, we have had guests come speak to us about, but Africa doesn't get a lot of coverage, um, um, really bothers me. Um, It's something that I'm looking at. um, And one of the reasons why um, is because we have, as a media business, decreased our coverage and our people on the ground in places like Africa. Uh, In fact, By one study, there are virtually no American reporters stationed in Africa anymore. It might as well not exist. Uh, uh, One study found um, over all the references to Africa that people actually thought Wakanda was the fourth most commonly referenced African country. So I'm really upset about this and I have to bring up because we talk a lot about what happens when a hurricane hits here. I don't know if you knew, there's a tropical cyclone, Anna, now in Madagascar that's killed dozens of people and left 65,000 people without homes. 65,000 people, just happened yesterday, Zippo, zero, not in the news. Um, And there's a direct correlation between the amount of people we have on the ground, the news that we're getting. Um, A lot of people say like, well, we're not making any money. I, I was speaking with someone today, the other day. We're not making money if we have people in Africa, but it's not always about money. It's about information. It's about trying to create a global community. Um, I hope you agree with me on this. And there, you know, and there's so much going on in Africa that I think that we need to elevate. And so I'm really grateful for this podcast for being able to share uh, Africa stories. Well, I think it was important when we had uh, Ambassador Charles Ray. Uh, a year and a half ago, and then uh, really just a little bit more than a month ago, month and a half, we had uh, Howard French, I think really laying out why Africa matters to doorstep concerns in the US. Uh, A lot of things we don't think about, but also because Africa, things can happen there, which are test cases for things that then show up in other parts of the world. And there's two news stories uh, in Africa uh, that have real applicability. One is that uh, Uganda is turning to uh, Russian political and election quote unquote experts in how to manage the election system, uh, which has implications obviously for the strength of democracy. And then the other is uh, the, uh, we had Sean McFade on a few weeks ago talking about new rules of war and private military outfits and and what they're doing. Uh, Allegations that the coup in Burkina Faso uh, was uh, uh, under, undertaken by military officers uh, that wanted to bring uh, the Wagner group uh, to work uh, with them and that uh, they were overridden by the president. And then suddenly the president finds himself uh, out of his job. So uh, things that may happen in Africa don't necessarily stay in Africa. And uh, coverage of what happens there uh, is important for us because trends that start there will begin showing up in other parts of the world and then perhaps even on our own doorsteps. Amen to that. Um, and crypto, let's talk about the decline. Everybody's talking about the decline. I, I have to admit, I, I saw it's a bubble. It's a bubble, but but why do you think it happened? You have some thoughts. Just very quickly, two things. One is that uh, we now understand that some of the energy policies that were undertaken in places like Kazakhstan were driven by uh, the interest of uh, groups there to to harness energy for crypto mining. And one of the things we've seen is that since uh, the uh, change of, uh, somewhat change of government in Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan has uh, cut back on crypto mining. Uh, The other thing, of course, and this ties back not only to our podcast with uh, David Yermak uh, last year, but our book talk with uh, Casey Michelle uh, 
earlier this week in Russia. Uh, the Russian government is very anxious to uh, prohibit uh, Russians from uh, holding or transferring assets in cryptocurrencies for the uh, reason that they uh, fear that uh, Russia's wealthy will try to use crypto as a way to get their uh, assets out of Russia, uh, away not only from Western sanctions, but also from the ability of the Russian government to, to tap into those uh, sources of wealth. So some really interesting developments there. Uh, which again highlight uh, points that uh, previous guests on the doorstep have been making. And I think also highlight the global wealth accumulation among the select few, which happens to be our next book talk, because Davos just happened, but it was virtual. So it's not the same as we're going to read about in Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devoured the World, uh, with Peter S. Goodman, February 8th, 6 p.m. Watch out for some signups. Um, but I think this will really tie together uh, the things we've spoken about today and, and we just spoke about um, in, this week with Casey. Um, so we're greatly looking forward to our book talk and now to Rachel Zamba. Good morning, Rachel. Thank you so much for coming back to the doorstep. We're so excited to have you. Uh, I think at an important point in the world today, um, you spoke with us last year about what sanctions were, were they effective? And let me tell you, that's all we hear about these days. Sanctions, sanctions, sanctions. And I'm gonna, let's start with the elephant in the room because I yesterday, President Biden said he's gonna personally sanction or do a personal sanction on Putin. And I thought, what is that? And why is it scary? And I thought, thank God I'm speaking with Rachel. <laughs> what, is, what is a personal sanction? Is it scary? <sighs> Are sanctions even in play here? Uh, Tatiana, first, uh, thanks, thanks to you both. It's a delight to be back and chat with you guys with so much going on, so many moving pieces. So <clears throat> personal sanctions would be targeting the personal assets of Vladimir Putin as with any official. The challenge with Putin is that it's hard to know exactly what he owns, right? There's a lot of, and some of it's the same issues with any powerful leader in an autocratic state or semi-autocratic state. They can have their hands in a variety of pies, um, but it's particularly so with Putin because there are question marks about which of the energy companies he might have stakes in or other things. And so there's lots of different views out there. And I'm, I'm definitely not followed the money where, where all of it, where, where Putin personally is concerned. I tend to track more of the Russian state um, apparatus. Um, but I think the, for the president, President Biden's comments, I think are part of a whole debate in Washington and, and in European capitals about what are the measures that would influence Russia. Um, and it's, and there's a whole school of people that would re that have been saying for many years, target the oligarchs, hit them where it hurts. And, you know, you could say Putin is part of that group. There was a view some years ago, hit the oligarchs and they'll influence Putin and change the story. I've always been a little bit skeptical of that because I think we have seen, uh, I think we tend to see sanctions often concentrate power structures in societies like Russia that are set up to be defensive and in where they, they, they think the goals are on their, their side. Um, but, but to your bigger question is, you know, are sanctions at play? Should they be at play? I think it's very difficult to craft a sanctions package that really, that, 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 that we know would lead to policy change. It's much easier, and I say this as an economist, it's easier to sit here and say, how do you craft a package that would hurt Russia economically, that would hurt certain interests? It's much harder to say, well, that leads to the kind of policy change we want, which is not only pulling back the troops from Ukraine, or from, from near Ukraine, it's a whole set of activities. Um, and one of the things that's concerned me for some time where Russia is concerned has been that we've increasingly grouped sanctions for a whole set of what we call malign activity. And so it would be hard to imagine even if policy started to change around disinformation and cyber hacking and, you know, the whole long list you guys talked about all the time, how would we sort of lift this sanction but not that sanction? But 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 I mean, being serious, I, I don't mean to say that we should be doing nothing. 
um, because there was a lot, there's a lot here at, at stake. There's a lot of sort of slippery slopes that are sort of going on. But just to say that just imposing a lot of economic costs doesn't necessarily lead to, to policy change. I tend to think sanctions are most effective when there's a really sort of clear goal, a uh, clear strategy, that it's not just about sanctions and coercive economic tools, but also in this case, um, mil you know, sort of military deterrence, a variety of other things. And in an ideal world, we wouldn't have been at this point, we would have maybe um, had an upside, you know, sort of a set of policies that um, might give Russian elites, might give even Putin an interest in a different policy path. Now, sometimes I feel a little Pollyanna-ish when I talk about that, but I do think it's, it's sort of a conversation um, sort of worth, worth having. So long way around, I think also what President Biden is trying to say is a lot of different sanctions, a lot of things are on the table um, and the like. This is unique. This is one of the first times I have ever seen a U.S. administration lay out, here's all the things we're thinking about. They're, they're almost negotiating in public. And part of that, I think, is because they want to show they're as united as they can be with Europe, which is hard to do, but also because they want to, you know, they're hoping that laying those things out has a deterrence element to it. We'll see what happens. I don't think anyone wants to see a circumstance where some of these strong economic measures have to be used because they'd be painful for the global economy, but so too would um, invasion and disrespect of national sovereignty. That's a great point that I wanted to, to continue to ask you to expand on because what's critical about this next round of sanctions discussions, as opposed to what we saw, in, particularly in the second term of the Obama administration, and even during the Trump administration, was that sanctions tend to be imposed that don't really have so much of a doorstep impact uh, on the sanctioning countries. Uh, the sanctions that are being laid out, and then of course yesterday, Russia's uh, own threats about its counter sanctions, uh, we're talking about things like uh, energy disruption. Uh, we're talking about uh, companies uh, with contracts not being able to uh, be paid for their goods and services. Mm -hmm. We're talking about uh, clients that, uh, you know, goods that would be sanctioned where an American or European firm uh, is doing a project in Russia and that will hit their bottom line and then have ripple effects uh, outward. What's your sense as to how or the, uh, the willingness uh, from what you've seen, from what you've observed, you're very active, obviously, in these uh, discussions, uh, particularly on Twitter, engaging so many people in trying to get to the bottom of this. What's your sense as to the resolve to, to really drop the hammer uh, if, it, if it is going to mean real costs, domestic costs in Germany, in France, in Italy, uh, in Britain, perhaps even in the United States, uh, Maybe not so much, uh, but given that Russia is one of the largest oil suppliers to the United States right now, uh, and we saw how the Biden administration, uh, all for all of its talk about green transition, uh, once uh, prices at the pump hit a certain level, uh, they were back to um, not quite drill, baby, drill, but pump or OPEC pump. So do you see that there's a political will? to impose these kinds of costs if there's going to be real domestic disruption? Yeah, you raise a really important point. And, and in a sense, I think the mixed messaging we've seen, particularly out of Germany, though more recently out of, out of France in a different way, um, I think has been highlighting particularly these energy risks. Um, I mean, I think there, there is a willingness and maybe a sliding scale, depending on which ally one talks to, but there is a willingness that in the case of a major incursion and invasion, that does need to be met with things that might um, have meaningful impacts on the population. I think the challenge, the challenge there, is, and, and I think what we've seen over the last, uh, over th this week, you know, sort of towards the end of January is the Biden administration sort of saying, okay, well, you're worried about energy implications. Um, let's try to deal with this energy crisis. Let's try to replace some of this. I know, Nick, you, you've written about this issue of the way that Russia was taking advantage 
um, and, and foment, you know, sort of adding to as well as taking advantage of the energy situation and imbalances in Europe last year in 2021 going into 2022. And I think that in some ways uh, complicates it. it. The events of last year, which, which in my mind were partly triggered by a fundamental imbalance as the global economy reopened, Asia demanded more natural gas, you had, we were sitting here in the summer of last year saying, well, there's no stockpiles, nobody's filling up the natural gas storage. Uh, why are they not doing that? Putin saying, well, approve Nord Stream 2 and suddenly you have a lot of gas. And I'm like, well, okay, may maybe, but if, if prices are high, why aren't you sending that gas anyways? <laughs> um, which, which maybe goes back to the conversation earlier about which economic interests, short or long term are most influential to Russia. And so I, I think to some extent, this concern around this, this risk of going into conflict, you know, military conflict, economic conflict on all fronts, which is, which is, which is the risk scenario we're looking at. Um, we often think about sanctions as the alternative to sort of um, using military tools. In this case, I think you, you could see them hand in, in hand. Um, uh, is, is sort of what happens to those critical supply chains. I, and, and as maybe focus the mind of saying, well, how do we deal with this short-term issue? But I think you rightly highlight this question mark of, well, do short-term measures this year, um, where does that fit in with these longer-term goals around the energy transition? We know that among the things Russia is unhappy about, and there's a long list, are the fact that European banks won't green light financing of European project, of energy projects on environmental grounds, not just anything relating to the system. Uh, it's much harder to get uh, funding for projects in Russia's north, Northeast. Uh, the Europe wants to stop drilling in the Arctic. Um, countries, even countries like Norway are, are not quite so on board with that, but the EU, um, the Russia is worried about CBAM, the border adjustment mechanism. So there's a number of kind of issues and different sort of economic models that are, I think are at stake here. Um, but but I'm, I'm sorry, and I've sidestepped your question of, of how much willingness. Um, I think that part of this trying to focus and crystallize attention <clears throat> on where additional supplies might be is part of this um, effort the U.S. is doing to try to keep the alliance together, try to make sure that they're not fissures that Putin can take advantage of. He, along with Xi Jinping and Chinese leaders, are very good at playing those, those fissures and, and widening them. Um, but I think ultimately what we'll see in any sanctions package will not be anything that directly targets energy supplies. It's probably more a risk from a counter sanction side. And then the other thing is, if there's a risk of military conflict, there's a lot of different scenarios that could impact energy supplies and pipelines, but also grain supplies. Um, you know, Ukraine and Russia are big suppliers of grain. Russia already stopped uh, exporting as much because they had a poor harvest. So actually Ukraine's been benefiting in the short term, but there are important supplies here that could exacerbate some of the doorstep issues you guys are uh, looking at, right? This has already been a year where food prices are rising. There are fertilizer challenges that come from having big sanctions or sanctions on Belarus. There are other issues where high energy prices in Europe mean that fertilizer plants aren't operating because they're really energy intensive. There's a lot of different pieces. And let's not forget that the, some of the biggest buyers of Eurasian grain are in the Middle East, Middle East. Turkey, Egypt. And, and I don't want to sort of, you know, overstate the risks, but let's also not forget that the Arab Spring came after a year where Fuel, uh, where um, food prices rose rapidly in part because of poor harvests and export controls of grain uh, from Russia. So there are a lot of sort of uh, potentially challenging issues. One of the reasons that this, this agriculture issue is one of the reasons why agriculture is not one of the sectors that is on this sort of target list. And I, if anything, I think the um, 
worries about the impact on the doorstep for Europeans, for Americans, for kind of global consumers has been why the US government's pivoted more towards trying to use export controls and not just what we think of as financial sanctions. So, so they're likely to target banks, but this thinking about uh, cutting off supply of electronics, of software, Russian companies have been under orders to use more domestically made software. State-owned enterprises have not done a great job applying, you know, sort of applying that. Import substitution is hard and it's costly. Um, but in a sense, I see that in part as the U.S. effort to look around and say, well, what's the asymmetric power we have now? We've used some of the asymmetric power over 2014 or since 2014 and 2015. Um, and so, and, and then Russia has adjusted to some of those measures. We might look and say, okay, well, they're choosing not to grow. That's a cost. But, but that is a choice that they're making. So I do see this push towards export controls as being that attempt to try to say, well, what are the things that might hit Russian, you know, sort of doorstep issues and not, um, but as I think a number of people have rightly highlighted, things like export controls, they're, they're more sort of longer term sort of structural issues. And we've seen Chinese companies uh, adjust to some of those uh, sort of controls. Um, I might say Russian would have a harder time doing that than a Huawei um, or a Chinese industrial complex, but uh, their, their limitations and their costs to all these tools, including, um, including to sort of uh, global trade and the like. And I think your point at the doorstep is that, and you know, it's, I've heard it loud and clear, is that really our doorstep it doesn't matter to us, <laughs> right? That it does matter to Germany and it maybe matters to Germany because they don't have Merkel to kind of pull it all together, right? And they're a little bit of a mess. Um, and it matters mm -hmm. to the UK because they're also in a mess because Boris Johnson is a disaster. So, you know, and, you know, you could say the same here that, you know, especially the right in the US is playing up this Ukraine issue. It is just amazing what you hear on right wing channels. Uh, and I think it's because they want yeah. to Biden as weak. But really, truly, our doorstep issue, our doorstep stake in this is, I don't know, do we even have one that that's going to really hurt us? You know, and, and, you know, what I've seen or with what I've talked to with, you know, my students and kind of, you know, the Gen Z's, they, it doesn't even register. It doesn't even register because they're more worried about the fact that Biden is not um, relieving their loans. Um, they're more worried about inflation. I can't afford to live in New York City, for example. Mm, yeah. um, you know, and, and so I think that, you know, this whole push, this military, and even the military push, if you want to push people who love the military, even that doesn't resonate with the younger generation. Like it, there's, you know, so I, I feel like, you know, you talk about us leading a coalition, making sure there's no fissures, but I think it's difficult when we're coming for, from a position where our doorstep says, who cares? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I, and, and, and I think to the, uh, the, and, and the other thing that I imagine your students are also bringing up that I hear from sort of some of mine or others is, sort of what does all of this, you know, where was all, where is all this urgency we're thinking about climate issues and the climate crisis in certain sort of subsets. Um, uh, but maybe that's because I've spoken to too many people that have watched Don't Look Up. Um, but uh, yeah, great, great movie. Sc you know, scary, the more, the more one elapses from it. Um, uh, but uh, you know, and, and I think really interesting, I'm sure your sort of journalism and other students might have a sort of heyday with that. But I guess the challenge is also that this is sort of, I mean, where the doorstep issues for us are on, on the risk side, and we've talked about energy, but I do think the fact that this is coming at a time where we don't really have, we haven't figured out what's the, the narrative around, you know, how we talk about inflation. Right. And some of it's always asymmetric, like when prices go down, you know, and suddenly, you know, it doesn't cost much to fill up a tank of gas or other things. You know, we're not quite as happy as the asymmetry of how upset we are. Um, now, of course, usually when prices go down like that, 
it's because people around us are losing jobs or something else is going on. So, so it's often not unmitigated good news. Um, but this sort of element of how we kind of deal with those pressures and the dis, you know, sort of um, some of the, the the dislocations, the sort of, um, you know, we're headed into sort of a point, um, you know, of monetary normalization. There's a fiscal cliff. Um, who knows what's happening with sort of all the other elements of the agenda? But I think you're very right to highlight there is many kind of divides and fissures uh, at home. Um, in thinking about what this really means, you know, it continues to be difficult to kind of what's the narrative around selling the benefits of alliances and forward basing, whether that's traditional military or sort of intelligence gathering. And I think, I mean, Britain is maybe the most clear example, but this element that we've seen in a variety of places, even recently in Australia with Djokovic of, you know, do rich people get their own say of the rules and you know, what are the interests? I think this does make it difficult to think about what's the, you know, what's the role in the world and, 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 and sort of the, um, the goal and how do you navigate towards these kind of medium term goals, whether it's around the energy transition um, and the like. And I think that makes it, uh, that lack of cohesion and sort of common goals um, make it a hard thing to, because you, you end up more likely with sort of blunt measures needing to do something to do it, or, or as Nick said, a circumstance where the way you deal with energy shortages is saying OPEC and Russia pump more oil. Um, and I think that, that, that messaging, it's not just about messaging. I mean, you need to have a good strategy and then you need to communicate it well. It's not, you know, one, you know, both are necessary. Um, and I think that's something that, uh, you know, sort of there's a challenge now, um, even though there's, I think, a lot of people aware that that is an issue. Um, and, and that I think is going to become, uh, that is going to become a challenge, especially as we get closer to the midterms. And, and I think the narrative issues, you know, we see it as well with, with China, right, um, where there's... Uh, maybe uh, mixed, mixed views when it comes to sort of the doorstep about what we should be doing. Oh, thank you for bringing up China. I just, I know Nick, you have a question. I just, I was reading today, um, it, you know, and we always talk about, you know, let's put pressure on China either with sanctions or we're not sending our diplomats to the Olympics, which are by the way, starting soon. And all of a sudden I'm reading actually all investors are pouring money into China right now because there's inflation around the world. So China's the best bet. And I just thought, my God, it's just like cabaret, money, 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 money. And, and really the mess, the strategy and the messaging are completely lost because everybody is just worried about making money. Um, and, and, you know, if that's a doorstep issue that I think we can probably around the world get our, our you know, our hands around, right? Like that's what people are concerned about. I think, I don't know when the Fed is coming out with its statement today, but I think that's what everybody's looking for. Two o'clock. Um, yeah, two o'clock. All right, two o'clock. We're going to be tuning in. Um, you know, what are you expecting with that? And is the message coming from the Fed going to reverberate in Germany, in Ukraine, in Russia? You know, it, does that matter? You know, does that money aspect matter? more and you know going back to the first personal sanction part right you might we might not know because of what we talked about in our book talk this everything's hidden yeah. in offshore shell companies um but but maybe that's the pressure point if we could find that money pressure point um you know and, and that would make a difference I, I don't know i'm kind of spitballing here <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it does matter, right? And and to some extent with markets, um, even just the cha you know, a change in tone and the change in um, alignment mattered, right? We've seen a lot of money sort of shift, um, you know, not that it's been good for bonds for, you know, for a while, but, you know, sort of selling bonds, rising interest rates. So, you know, this has been, last two weeks have been a pretty rocky ride in the equity market. And we might well see more more of the same. Some of that has been, and 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 if we look at emerging markets, rate markets. I mean, there are countries like Brazil that are pricing in interest rates going to double digits. I don't think it's going to happen, 
um, for a variety of reasons we can get into. But you know, interest rates were you know in the low single digits um, in the, the sort of um, in 2020 after they, they they cut rates. I mean, Russia also markets are pricing that have to do very defensive policies. But you know, obviously there's particular circumstances there. But what worries me about the sort of Fed exit. Um, which I have to do, right? We, you know, the Fed, as well as U.S. fiscal authorities, they came through with stimulus. They did a lot. They kind of <clears throat> helped us kind of keep things moving. The unfortunate thing is that big companies, entities that could already get credit, they were the ones that got even more, right? Big AAA or, you know, high rated companies, strong sovereigns, including the U.S. or countries like Canada, European countries, they could borrow super cheap, even some emerging markets. Now what's been happening is emerging markets have already been facing this challenge of needing to withdraw stimulus. They can't do much on the fiscal side. And a number of them are really struggling to grow. And the policy mix, both around because of COVID, um, but also structural issues, uh, really domestic demand is a challenge so you look at a country like mexico which is barely which has been barely growing for a few years brazil um south africa um uh, and and these are sort of major emerging markets that might not have economic growth on a per capita basis over the next couple of years that had i mean think about what that means from a you know, the impact on their on their doorsteps, which then impact their sort of willingness to grapple with the things that might be important to, to us. Mexico is responding to some of those issues by saying, okay, well, we're no longer going to export energy. Now, now maybe, you know, there, there, there are plenty of other sources, but that push towards nationalization, that push to sort of um, you know, it's uh, sort of think about, you know, sort of uh, national, deep in national supply chains, it has, has impacts. Now, I'm not saying that um, there can't be, that there isn't a benefit to increasing competitiveness, increasing sort of manufacturing value added in a country like the US. Um, but if everyone's trying to do that at the same time and not in a coordinated way, we could end up with a lot of costs that businesses are having to, to face. I mean, China, one of the big challenges um, and maybe sort of black you know, marks on, on those sort of uh, over the last year has been the fact that even at, that, that if anything, as China sticks with zero COVID and doesn't have much domestic demand them, themselves as a result, their exports have gone up and external imbalances have sort of um, gone up. So like the U.S. is actually importing more from China uh, than, than it used to a couple of years ago. Um, China's still very involved in the supply chain, even as we diversify. So I think you sort of end up with a, a circumstance of divergent growth in, in different areas, a turn inward, which doesn't always bode well for um, political, you know, sort of political stability, regional stability, willingness to deal with regional um, and global issues, willingness to deal with long-term issues, and an environment where the Fed and other policymakers are needing to move away from having a really big punch bowl. Um, but I think people, we don't necessarily have the vocabulary to think about some of the kind of growth challenges some of the big emerging markets are happening. People ask me all the time, are we going to see a wave of debt, you know, debt distress, debt crisis? So, well, some of the countries are going to have, uh, are, are really going to have to cut back on current spending to meet those debts. But what I really see is a growth crisis. And that, and we've seen some of these areas before, but this is not necessarily going to be a story where big countries default on their debts, um, in part because of the cost of that, but just we don't know all the impacts of what that's going to mean socially um, and, and how it amplifies some of the challenges that come from extreme weather, um, some of the sort of energy and other dynamics. I know that's a, a long way away from sort of, you know, sort of uh, some of these issues, but we're going to see also divergences in different countries about who can weather some of those challenges better. So I don't think it bodes incredibly well for global coordination. For example, even on things like canceling the debts of the, the world's poorest countries.
Um, and, and those are some of the things we need to do to kind of continue to kind of reach what our sort of new normality might be as we move into a different phase of the pandemic. Rachel, as I was just listening to this answer, I was struck by how much this seems to fit into what the Biden administration announced last year, foreign policy that benefits the middle class. You're talking about uh, conditions where we're importing more from China than we did in the past. You're talking about real economic stress in the rest of the hemisphere, which has implications, not only that Mexico is one of America's biggest trading partners, uh, but then of course the related migration crisis into the United mm -hmm. States. And yet the, the issue that dominates the national security community is a security crisis in Eastern Europe. So is there, how does this, after you've seen the first year of the Biden administration, where do you think the foreign policy for the middle class narrative is going? Uh, is this, was just, just a slogan uh, to appeal to people that uh, felt that Washington was out of touch? Or do you think that we've now fallen back into we're reacting to crises as they happen rather than kind of being proactive, as you said in, earlier, about being able to respond to these middle time frame issues that uh, aren't the crises of the day. Yeah, so I think I have to kind of give a, a bit of a mixed grade there because I do think the Biden administration did come out trying to do a number of things. And, you know, we can raise questions about things like how far COP26 went, probably didn't go far enough, um, comparing it to what it would have been in a different administration, obviously a, a different sort of dynamic setting in motion by a regulation, a number of changes. Um, uh, you know, it's not the whole story, but some of the work that the administration has been doing around semiconductors and technology and other things like that, they've borne some fruits. And, um, you know, it's not just about, you know, sort of what uh, foreign companies or U.S. companies are opening up boundaries and factories and the like in the U.S., but those are in some cases, well-paying jobs. It's about sort of innovation and training and other things like that. Um, but of course, offset by things like um, the fact that in a number of STEM areas, if there's not the same ability for uh, global citizens to come and study, what are the sort of implications? Uh, what happens if we no longer trust um, you know, other countries to sort of share um, you know, in, in sort of R&D. I mean, there's, there's mixed stories, but I mean, I do, we think we have to, um, you know, hire, you know, some of the coordinated work, for example, with the Quad, um, with other things like that, trying to think about co, you know, sort of co-investment on some projects uh, does sort of directly or indirectly support some of these, these foreign policy for the middle class goals. The challenge is, or, or, or before I get to the challenge, I mean, I think one of the things that was different across the legislative agenda um, uh, and, and tools more generally in the economic statecraft area is went from a period over a few administrations of focusing more on the restrictive set of tools. And we, we've talked about this a lot, uh, the sanctions, the export controls, the investment restrictions, especially the sanctions, um, to things about how do we do things differently at home to either support a range of goals and become more um, resilient. Now, uh, you, you both had a great discussion, a scary discussion, um, you know, about American kleptocracy earlier this week. And that's a prime example of where there needs to be more work to increase resiliency at home and sort of address some of these issues. And it's hard once that, um, you know, has, has blown up in that way. I think there are a number of areas, both around domestic investment, but things that are in either pa uh, approved legislation or not yet approved legislation, like USICA and the CHIPS Act. I mean, CHIPS Act, you know, is a question of how much uh, semiconductors and other production we're going to have. USICA in it includes a lot of additional funding for the National Science Foundation. It includes funding for uh, co-investment with Asian allies critical to our supply chain, that focus of what one might call either the sort of positive or the sort of uh, constructive as opposed to just the, the restrictive, I think is a shift. I mean, there was some of that under the Trump administration, but I think it was muddied by the fact 
that at the same time, there was some co-investment. There was a lot of, well, let's target allies. Let's, you know, there, there was a different, there, there was a different form of America first. <laughs> they're, they're, they're in, in that sort of way. Um, so, so I think there's mixed stories. It's probably a lot more rhetoric than there is sort of action. Um, and, and I think there still is that challenge, as I think Tatiana alluded to, of, you know, what are the benefits of, uh, you know, how can we sort of talk about democracy around the world if we have such challenges with our democracy um, at home and the recent dynamics around voting rights, around sort of the rules and, and regulations in our, our candidate of, um, the, you know, sort of the dynamics in Congress, I think only kind of, you know, bear, bear that out. But I do think that people in the administration believe that sort of, uh, b believe that they're trying to do foreign policy for the middle class. The challenge is that, well, two things. One, crises sort of come up. Um, I think, some of the dynamics we're facing with Russia right now are in part maybe a reaction to the fact that it seemed like yet again, the administration was trying to pivot towards China, towards Asia, to sort of um, change its policy towards Russia, but hope that Russia would just stay there and be happy with what was sort of going on. And so while I do believe you can do multiple things at once, I think the focus on climate, the focus on China, the difficulties, you know, given Russia's own choices to integrate them into that sort of metric, um, I think have been one of the many sort of things that we've had to react to. The unfortunate thing is that even over the course of the summer and, and so on, there were certain things like energy vulnerabilities and so on that, you know, it's not easy to deal with. But I think that made it uh, even more difficult to kind of coordinate um, with, with Europe um, and to sort of um, balance the short term issues and the longer term reorientation um, in, in, in those ways. So, you know, jury's still out on what it will look like. Um, and I think back to the messaging point and the strategy point. There's been so much focus on things like increasing manufacturing, focusing on supply chains, dealing with the you know, ravages of the pandemic that I think, you know, some of the dynamics of why there's as many or more costly imports from China than there ever were are about the fact that people don't want to see empty shelves. Yeah. Right, you can't necessarily shift production everywhere, you know, at, at once. Um, you know, uh, I'm I'm sitting here in Canada right now, where there are people who are very upset about the fact that truckers now need to, you know, sort of need to be vaccinated to cross the border, and will that impact the um, uh, the sort of uh, supply chain further? The real issue is whatever else is going on that people don't want to be truckers and what wages we pay to them and the like. So some of it is, there's not just one set of policies that's foreign policy for the middle class. And, and, uh, and I mentioned that truckers strike in part, not to elevate it, because I, I think, but to say that it's a bit a nexus of illicit finance and disinformation and a lot of things that the Canadian and American government should be concerned about, which is just another way of bringing it back to some of the, um, the ways in which doorstep concerns and unha you know and and grievances can be you know sort of can be amplified and uh, taken you know sort of taken advantage you know they can feed into uh, different you know sort of different different challenges and can become a a real challenge for sort of law enforcement those tracking illicit finance and really say that you know sort of our our structures at home need to continue to be modernized, whether it's around dealing with uh, digital security, whether it's dealing with financial transactions, all of these things. So foreign policy for the middle class is, uh, is a whole diverse um, area. Thank you so much for that an analysis. Uh, foreign policy also asked experts, and I think they came down exactly where you were. It's incomplete, 
maybe a C plus. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll continue this conversation. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, absolutely, we got to watch this growth crisis, uh, I think, and, and have you back and also see what happens with the Fed in the short term and in the medium term, what happens with Ukraine. Uh, so thank you so much, um, Rachel, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Great to chat with you. Thanks for listening to The Doorstep, sponsored by the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. For more, go to carnegiecouncil.org. Stay healthy and safe.